Now, from WYDC-TV, this is Big Fox News at 10. We begin tonight in Corning. With COVID restrictions limiting the amount of in-person shopping, the Gaffer District is hoping that a new service will help local businesses out. Matt Kleinditz joins us now to explain how this new service works. Good evening. The Gaffer District is launching a new delivery service aimed at helping local Corning businesses just in time for the holidays. Trying to make it as easy as we possibly can for the customer. After weeks of planning, the Gaffer District rolled out its new Crystal City Traditions delivery service. The service aims at getting residents to shop locally while limiting in-person contact. Colleen Fabrizi says it's also a way to help Corning businesses stay afloat during the pandemic. Shopping local can make the difference uh, in whether or not some of these small businesses survive. Shoppers will be able to place their order at the business of their choosing, who in turn will work with the Gaffer District to deliver the order. You make that purchase online or over the phone, they reach out to us and we deliver it, much like you would, would, would do for a takeout food order. With the help of Ferrario dealerships, deliveries can be made within a 30 mile radius of Corning. We're talking about Watkins Glen, Montour, Burdett, Pine City, Addison, Elmira, you know, Horsehead, uh, it's, it's quite a stretch. Delivery services will run until December 23rd, allowing residents time to finish their holiday shopping list. Right in time for Christmas. You can go to the Gafford District's website for a list of participating businesses, as well as a list of deals going on at Corning area stores. Reporting from Corning, Matt Kleindens, Big Fox, WYDC. The United States set a grim record on Monday with more than 96,000 people hospitalized with COVID-19. Now health officials do expect cases to skyrocket after the travel scene during the Thanksgiving holiday. But there is promising progress on the vaccine front. John Lawrence reports. A new chapter in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic may soon start. We're just the beginning. It's great news, but let's make the best of a good story. Drug maker Moderna applied to the Food and Drug Administration for authorization of its vaccine, which the company says is 94.5% effective in all cases and 100% effective in preventing severe cases of the virus. Ten years of work, several billion dollars of investment have gone into putting us in a position to be relevant in this uh, important time. Drug maker Pfizer applied for authorization for its vaccine November 20th. If both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines get emergency approval, 40 million doses could be available by the end of this month, as long as there aren't any major setbacks. And there are still some unanswered questions. How long it lasts, for example? What are the long-term side effects, for example? The FDA's advisory committee is meeting this month to review the two applications. It'll be months before the vaccines are widely available, and health officials are still urging Americans to wear masks and keep physical distance. Dr. Anthony Fauci talking to Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg on Monday. Help is on the way, but it's not here yet. So we can do these things, and we can prevent an even further escalation. I'm John Lawrence reporting. The coronavirus may have come to the United States earlier than previously thought. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has said the first COVID-19 cases in the U.S. were reported in mid-January. However, according to a study published Monday, the novel coronavirus could have started infecting people in the United States a month earlier. CDC researchers analyzed blood donations collected by the American Red Cross from December 13th of 2019 through January 17th of 2020. There were more than 7,000 samples collected from nine states. They were tested for SARS-CoV-2 reactive antibodies. Of the 7,000 samples tested, more than 100 were found to have the antibodies for SARS-CoV-2. Field hospital beds in Rhode Island are now being used for the first time in the COVID-19 pandemic. Brian Crandall reports. Field hospital beds in Rhode Island will now be used for the first time in the pandemic. We really hoped that we would never ever need to use this. Dr. Laura Foreman is overseeing the 335 bed Cranston Field Hospital operated by Care New England, seeing its first patients coming from Kent Hospital this evening. 
we're expecting to, to be taking care of a lot of folks here. The Convention Center Field Hospital has 600 beds run by Lifespan. We are at a situation with hospital capacity where this site is needed for patient care. The Convention Center ballroom space was converted in the spring, was in the process of being taken apart, but was then put back together in the past few weeks with the dramatic surge in cases. The level of care here mimics the level of care at the hospital. The plan for both field hospitals is to take patients from the regular hospitals that need the least amount of care. The goal is to free up space in the regular hospitals, but is there enough staff to do both? Lifespan says it has enough people to take care of 100 patients here before having to contract out for more help. And in Cranston? We've been really challenged to get staff here. We are taking volunteers. We are taking anybody um, who is capable. Of Rhode Islanders received a text alert this morning repeating what the governor has said recently, that the state's hospitals are full and to stay home as much as possible for the next two weeks as her two-week pause or partial shutdown begins today with closed bar areas, gyms, movie theaters, recreational venues, and reduced restaurant capacity. One of the things that you can do to help us in managing hospitalizations is to follow the governor's orders and take that pause. We didn't have to be here, knowing that had we as a population come together and, and all stayed safe and stayed distanced and stayed home and stayed masked, that we could have avoided this. A Birmingham mother of seven has taken on raising her sister's five kids after she and her husband both died from COVID-19. Lauren Jackson introduces us to the single mom now working to care for a dozen children. It just seemed like it's not real. Like, we just expect her to come back. It's been just over two months since Francesca McCall lost her younger sister to COVID-19. She was in the healthcare field and she did all the precautions. She wore the mask, she wore the gloves. She was very, very careful. So we have no idea how she came into contact. Only 35 years old, her sister tested positive for the virus and quickly began having trouble breathing. She was put on a ventilator at UAB Hospital where she died less than two weeks later. Dr. Carter did to say our last goodbyes and I told her, we talked to her and we just told her, I told her she didn't have to worry because I was going to make sure that I take care of her kids because I knew she would have did it for me. Taking in her sister's five kids and with seven of her own, Francesca is now a single mom of 12. The oldest child is 17 and the youngest is two. They had their days. I don't think it really hit them yet, so it just a process. Francesca works full time from home now to help the kids with their virtual learning. She says it's been tough, but wouldn't want her nieces and nephews to be anywhere else. We're just going to try to raise them to be the best that they can be. She says it's been hard financially since losing her sister, but plans to give the children the best holiday she can. I'm worried about a little bit. Just, I just want this to be an extra special Christmas for them this year. Urging others to be careful, hoping to prevent another family from losing a loved one. It's real and that is it's serious and take the necessary precautions. Lawmakers are calling for more coronavirus stimulus and pushing for a bipartisan bill. Ray Bogan has the latest from Washington. Members of Congress are putting pressure on leadership to pass more coronavirus legislation. They're sharing a bipartisan framework for future emergency relief. The $908 billion package includes $240 billion for state and local governments and $300 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program. It's inexcusable for us to leave town and not have an agreement. Senators also wrote a letter to their leadership urging them to extend unemployment benefits for freelancers and contractors and continue regular unemployment benefits 13-week expansion. Both expire the day after Christmas. Families all across America are struggling, that businesses are closing, that hospitals are overwhelmed. As lawmakers spoke, the Treasury Secretary and Federal Reserve Chairman testified before the Senate Banking Committee. Secretary Mnuchin encouraged Congress to pass another bill with $455 billion in unused CARES Act funds. I continue to believe that a targeted fiscal package is the most appropriate federal response. Chairman Powell explained low wage workers have been hit hardest by job loss, specifically women, Hispanics and African Americans. The economic downturn has not fallen equally on all Americans and those least able to bear to shoulder the burden have been hardest hit. 
FDA Commissioner Dr. Stephen Hahn was summoned to the White House this morning for a coronavirus vaccine briefing. He says the decision for approval will be made by career scientists and they will take all the time they need. Ray Bogan, Fox News. The Potter's Hands Foundation is taking part in Giving Tuesday and asking residents for donations. Potter's Hands is a religious nonprofit that works to combat sex trafficking in western New York. The organization brings in survivors and provides them a safe and professional healing environment. Karen Stewart asks residents to donate so the organization can continue to help survivors. Human trafficking is in our backyards. It is happening all around us. And so we have to start in our backyards. We are doing the work, but we need you, the donators, to help us get the work done. There's still plenty of time to donate. You can donate by going to thepottershandsfoundation.org slash donate. Still ahead tonight, a family in Michigan mourning the deaths of not one, but two people from the coronavirus. It's beautiful, but it's just so tragic. Kind of like Romeo and Juliet. More on the couple who died just one minute apart after battling COVID-19. Here's your local stock market update from Big Fox. Now, your Twin Tiers forecast from Big Fox. Tonight's Big Fox forecast is brought to you by William Matar. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Kim Walker with your weather update. Our highs today were actually in the 40s, and that was actually reached around midnight. From there, temperatures continued to plummet throughout the day, leaving us with temperatures right now that are about 5 to 10 degrees cooler than they were about 24 hours ago. Down to the south in Tawanda, about 15 degrees cooler than it was yesterday. Wednesday, we are expecting a few more snow showers that will continue through the day. By the afternoon, once the snow moves out, those winds will start to pick up and it's going to feel quite cold out there, making those temperatures feel about 10 degrees cooler than the actual reading. So here's a look at your planner. We start off with readings in the 30s, cloudy conditions throughout the day, dew points in the 20s, so it's going to be very dry air. Definitely going to need that lotion uh, before you head out the door and definitely bundle up because those winds will start to pick up during the day. Temperature readings only around 39 degrees at 11 o'clock, 41 by 1. And then those temperatures continues to steadily drop by mid afternoon into the evening hours. And of course, with the wind is going to make those temperatures feel more like the 20s and 30s throughout the day. So our future radar is drawing or drawing a lot of snow showers across much of our viewing area. So it's going to be widespread for the next couple of hours. And then around 7 o'clock in the morning, it looks like most of the activity starts to push off to the east. I'm expecting all the snow to end by early afternoon and move away. But once that happens, those winds will start to pick up and we are expecting blustery conditions by the afternoon on Wednesday. We have another system that will arrive by the weekend into early next week. This low will start to drift to the east and it is going to drive some snow toward our region. And so the snow or the chance of it will return by the end of the weekend. The jet stream starts to dig all the way to the south to the southwestern corner of the US. So a lot of us are going to be experiencing much colder air by the weekend. So for tonight, we are expecting clouds. Snow showers will continue. It will be windy with temperatures around 29 degrees. That's going to be a low in Corning, 32 degrees in Elmira. But take a look at this. Our highs only in the 30s in Perkinsville and in Hornell, 41 degrees in Corning and in Elmira. And it is going to be a breezy day, making those temperatures feel more like the 20s and 30s. Improving conditions on Thursday with a high around 47 degrees. Then with that next cold front coming in, we are expecting much colder readings for this weekend. Highs will only be near that 40 degree mark. Overnight lows will be in the 30s and it gets even colder on Monday with a high of 36.
The pandemic has taken a toll on many things in our lives, and the American Red Cross says it's impacted blood supplies. As the holidays approach, the organization says there is now a critical need. Mandy Gaither has more information on how you can help in today's Health Minute. We are very concerned. The holidays are always hard on blood donations, but now even more. Yes, people need to take care of themselves, be safe, be socially distant from one another, but uh, giving blood is an essential activity and we need people to respond now. Paul Sullivan with the American Red Cross says blood supplies are low with more than 100,000 blood drives canceled since the pandemic started. While some have been replaced, it's been challenging. Where we would normally collect blood in terms of schools, places of worship, community centers, some of those locations are not currently operating or, or obviously not bringing together the same numbers of people. Coronavirus convalescent plasma is also now being collected by the Red Cross. That's the antibodies from someone recovering from COVID-19 that can be used to help someone else who's battling it. The blood program has only become more important at a time where it's, where it's more challenging to get people to come out. A family in Michigan is mourning the death of not one, but two people from the coronavirus. The couple was married for 47 years, and they died on the same day, just one minute apart. Priya Mann has their story. It's beautiful, but it's just so tragic kind of like Romeo and Juliet. And like the star-crossed lovers, Leslie and Patricia McWalters died a minute apart. One wouldn't have wanted to be without the other. The couple was married for more than 47 years, inseparable since the day they met, the great-grandparents passed away in the hospital from COVID-19. But I can tell you this, that when they passed, we really do think, you know, that mom, the boss, she she definitely went went to his room and took him by the hand and said, come on, LD, let's go. Patricia was a no-nonsense surgical nurse. LD was a fun-loving truck driver, and somehow their personalities were a perfect fit. Overall, I think that it was just, just give and take. They picked their battles. But the coronavirus was a battle this elderly couple from Jackson couldn't beat. It's tough enough to lose one parent, but this was the worst. And like the thousands of Michiganders who've lost loved ones to the virus, Joanna says it's agonizing to hear others brush off the risk. People were talking about it and not knowing that my parents were in the hospital, both fighting for their lives with it. And it was just, I just had tears streaming down my cheeks listening to them. Our entire family is just completely devastated. This is the happy story you need today. A dog missing for a year is finally reunited with her owner. Leah Hope has that story. We're set to sniff you out. See, there you go. Hi. <laughs> this reunion was 11 months in the making. The dog named Gracie quickly gets the scent of her owner. She got close, she smelled me, and that tail just went wagging, and she just lost it, and I lost it. Before that joyous reunion was heartbreak. In December of last year, a visitor left a door open and Gracie darted out. I just cried for months. Over the summer, some Jackson Park Highlands neighbors noticed a beautiful black dog with white feet. What they didn't know is that Gracie had escaped less than two miles away. She was too afraid to get near people and avoided other dogs. But a determined neighbor, Polly Ellison, a pet owner herself, started feeding Gracie and spent months trying to gain her trust. She was uh, in obvious fear, potential harm. Um, I just couldn't turn my back on her. With the help of Katie Campbell, who rescues stray dogs in her spare time, they kept the routine and captured the dog. Campbell detected a microchip and tracked down her owner the same day. I just started crying all over again. People just need to realize the ability of a dog to survive and just never give up on them. Oh, well, tears of joy. She actually had an owner and a loving home to go home to and a sibling dog. It was, uh, it's been overwhelming. In the world that we live in and we hear all these bad things that there are actually kind-hearted, generous people who are willing to go above and beyond. Kelly Shade had Gracie since she was two months old. She and those involved in Gracie's safe return urge pet owners to microchip their pet, keep information updated, and post on Lost Dog Illinois if a dog is lost or found. 
Definitely a holiday miracle. To end it this way is definitely uh, remarkable. While the six-year-old pit bull has not left Shade's side since she was returned, amazing Gracie was not injured. The savvy, lucky dog survived on Chicago streets through winter, spring, summer, and fall, but is home for Christmas. A Colorado family says the difficulties of this year made it hard for them to get in the holiday spirit enough to decorate their home. So their neighbors decided to share their holiday cheer with the family. Megan Heiler has that story. After a hard year for the Thomas family, there wasn't much Christmas spirit to go around. To be honest, before all this happened, I had absolutely no Christmas spirit. I told my kids, I said, King of Christmas is dead this year. I just don't have the energy. I don't have it. My wife might die. How can I be excited for Christmas? So this turned everything around for me. This, I mean, it's like a miracle almost. Tom's wife, Andy, was diagnosed with breast cancer earlier this year. Doctors told her she had six months to live, but now she's almost to 10. Tom says dealing with the stress of that and being a disabled vet started to wear. So we posted on the Nextdoor app about how they would not be doing lights this year. That's when volunteers got involved. And, and being that we can actually get out here and help somebody that's totally, you know, out, of, out in the community, I think it's huge. And I think it sets the standard for everybody and every person in this community to do the same thing. About a dozen people showed up to help put up those decorations. As the Thomas family looked on, they couldn't help but get in the holiday spirit. It just excites me. It just excites me to see people that, that there's good humanity in this world, and we have people here in my neighborhood that prove it. A small gesture that made a big impact and certainly brightened a gloomy year. Being, you know, a military guy, I'm used to being a tough guy and don't shed a tear. So, so, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. I, you know, there are a lot of emotions that are probably inside that are going to come out later on. Just overwhelming. We want to leave you with a smile tonight. An Asian elephant who has spent much of his life alone in captivity arrived at a sanctuary in Cambodia on Monday. The journey to his new home is thanks in part to the efforts of pop star Cher. 36-year-old Kayvon spent years in grim conditions in a controversial Islamabad zoo where he suffered from a lack of exercise. Now Kayvon's days of loneliness are over. He arrived safely in Cambodia to a big welcoming committee, even a blessing from a few local monks. His new home, a sanctuary with a huge jungle enclosure. Love hearing that. From our whole team, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope you have a wonderful evening.